Are we headed for a complete collapse of society? Well, we are, yes. More than 300 people have been killed. Anti-war protesters have again clashed with police. Society has become wealthy, prosperous, urbanised. Birth rate dropped. This birth rate has continued to drop. Uh, Australian birth rates are dropping. And then they collapse. The point about my research is that the first time in history we actually can reverse it. I think you have to be fairly obsessed. Do you think that's a trait that you see in a lot of entrepreneurs? I am. I am obsessive. I mean, there's not a day goes by that I'm not thinking, how can I improve? What can I do better? Just never stop thinking about it. You pioneered a computer system of your own. That did a dramatic improvement in customer service. Well, to actually achieve that kind of success by advertising, you would have to spend millions of dollars a year. How have the universities been able to indoctrinate this whole it's, it's, it's system? It's a disease of wealthy societies again that people turn their back on manual work. Somehow somebody who sits down with an office with a computer is somehow better than somebody who works outside with their hands. That's completely rubbish. I wonder where the differences are. I can tell you the answer and you may want to excise this particular thing from your podcast. Something very odd happened to me as an adolescent and that is the one factor more than anything else that drives this peculiar character of mine. Jim Penman is the founder of the Jim's franchise and an awesome example of what tradies can achieve. But what you may not know about Jim is that he was originally an academic forced into his mowing business after his peers decided his ideas were way too radical. It's not every day I get to sit down with the founder of an estimated billion dollar company. So although this podcast is based on digital marketing, I did want to know more about Jim and what drives him to succeed. Now, there is a lot that goes into these episodes now. Uh, and if you're getting any value out of them, I want you to share this with a mate. This week is Tomo. I know Tom's been hanging out for a bloody awesome podcast. So pause this right now and give him a cheeky share. Share it, even if it's not Tom. <laughs> because the more people that find out about this podcast, the more tradies I get to reach and show the next generation how awesome a trade can be. Oh, and uh, did you like the intro? It was a bit of a ripper, wasn't it? You know, almost worth a five-star review, I reckon. Almost. Or it is. Anyway, let's get into it. Jim, you bloody legend. Welcome to the podcast. Good to be here. So I did a little bit of preparation before this podcast, and I actually found something on the internet that could potentially rock the very foundations of the Jim's group. You ready? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> Is your name actually Jim? Well, it is actually. But my name is David James Penman. I just used my middle name and shortened it to Jim. When did that happen? How did that happen? When I left school, I um, went to work on a farm for a while, took a gap year, and there was a kid about my age called David. And I just said, oh, call me Jim. Oh, okay. So you had two of the same people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was quite a small farm, and, and my boss was his father. So we just used to work together. So that was what I said. Well, I kind of like the name Jim. It's very, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's rugged. It's Australian. It's, you know, this guy's got dirt under his fingernails and calloused hands. It just, just seemed like a good, good change. <laughs> I don't know. I like the name David. Uh, it's a pretty legendary name as well. <laughs> well, women prefer, prefer David. They always say David's a nice name, but he's very, it's very civilized. It is very civilized. And I don't really want to be civilized all the time. Now, uh, most people would know you as Jim, the business, you know, mowing entrepreneur. But some people may not know that you're actually an academic and a historian. So I want to know who has been your favorite entrepreneur throughout history? Throughout history? Throughout history. The whole of history, Jim. Well, it doesn't make any sense, really. I mean, I mean, <laughs> if you look at people I admire now, it'd be people like Elon Musk and um, James Dyson, mm. who are great inventors, technologists. I mean, Musk is a very flaky character in, in many ways, but um, enormously capable in terms of what he's done with SpaceX. I, I admire people like that. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody a little bit earlier on? I know I would probably think of someone like a, a Nikola Tesla or something like that. 
Um, but he's more of an inventor. I don't know if he's an entrepreneur as such. Well, Henry Ford's got to be one of the greatest yes, for businessmen sure. of all time. I mean, what he did with the assembly line was extraordinary. He just turned something that had been a, a privileged toy for the rich, which is the motor car, into something that ordinary people could afford. His own workers could afford to buy a car. He just constantly worked on efficiency. It was an amazing thing, his plant. You could just put the raw materials one end, all the raw materials, and out of the other end, you come this stream of cars. Was he the first to pioneer that kind of process, the manufacturing process? No, not the first to pioneer. That goes back to the, like the 18th century. You talk about Adam Smith and nails and so forth and, and, and mass production. But, but he did it extraordinarily well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on your book, Ep Epigenetics and Character. Mm -hmm. Now, that book scared the crap out of me. <laughs> Uh, for a multiple different reasons. <laughs> well, that's, that's nice. That's good to hear. It should be scary. <laughs> it's a very scary book. Um, very good book, but it did scare the crap out of me. <laughs> uh, but I did want to touch on something where you could accurately predict somebody's character based on their upbringing. So I actually put your book into ChatGPT and I asked it, what would be the typical upbringing of somebody who was a mowing and gardening contractor? And I want to read you out what it spat out. All right? Okay. Your upbringing was likely involved a balance of discipline, structure, and practical skills development. You were probably raised in an environment that valued hard work, responsibility, and independence. Your C traits would have been well-developed, enabling you to manage routine and demanding aspects of your work effectively. Is this accurate? And is that a reflection on your upbringing? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, 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 the twist, personally, and that sort of thing, I mean, it, it's meaningless. What, it could apply to anybody or anything. I mean, seriously, well, how was my upbringing? Um, Strong-willed parents, quite irritable at times, um, <laughs> very intellectually driven. My father was enormously interested in, in all kinds of subjects. I didn't get on with him very well when I was growing up. Yeah. He was a very fierce character. So I don't know how you describe my upbringing. <laughs> I mean, my parents were great. They were very dedicated and they, and they sacrificed a lot for us. So I appreciate it. And I was very close to them, um, both of them, um, until they died. So, Was it a disciplined household that you grew up in? I mean, there were, you had three other siblings. Was that right? Well, pretty disciplined, yeah. Yeah. I think so. There were certain limits in, in terms of what we could do and, and how we behaved. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I, I think most people in those days, I don't forget, I grew up in the 50s and 60s and it wasn't just permissive, let all hang out parenting yeah. like today. Yeah. I don't know that parents were unusual in that respect. No, probably not. You're probably right. Yeah. Well, I, di I did kind of want to touch on your faith as well. So you, some people would know you as being Christian, mm -hmm. um, but you were actually an atheist. And in your in your book, Epigenetics and Character, you kind of call out uh, the importance of faith and religion in society. Was that a factor in becoming Christian? And then how has it benefited your, your life? It was a factor. I was a fairly militant anti-Christian for many years. I, really? I used to get into trouble. I went to an Anglican school and I used to get into trouble by doing things like challenging lecturers about their beliefs and so forth and putting things up on the notice board I wasn't supposed to put up. <laughs> so I was known as a rabble rouser. My best friend was suspended for, for a period during the, uh, our final year and told to stay away from me as a bad influence. So, I mean, that just gives you an idea. But what I was trying to do, what I was trying to understand from the time I was a teenager was why civilizations rise and fall. What causes them to collapse? And... When I went to university and started to study that seriously as part of a history degree, I came to the conclusion that the strength of a civilization is based on character, and it's a character that is largely formed by religion. Interesting. It, religion gets people to be disciplined, it controls sexual behavior, it does things which change character. And what happens when a society collapses is that the wealth and urbanization undermines that character. So that made me a lot more open to Christianity. But to a large extent, what happened is that I was walking through the student union one day, and um, this was um, 
at the age of uh, like 28 or so, mm. after many years at university, and I just got chatting to a group of people in the Christian Union booth, and I liked them. And I went on a retreat and had this very strong feeling that God spoke to me. Really? Mm. And was there a particular um, type of Christian faith that you're following currently? Well, I'm basically evangelical. I go to a Baptist church. Okay. But I've done all kinds of things. I've been Seventh-day Adventist. I was Mormon for many years. Really? You were Mormon as well? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's a great church, actually. Really, really great. Very strange theologically and in other ways, but the discipline and the sense of community is extraordinary. I, I, I loved it. And how important do you think it is, that discipline side of it, for society to, to currently keep the current society that we have? It's, it's crucially important. I mean, we're losing it. There's nothing much we can do in normal tens. We're just, the, the, the forces of urbanization and wealth are just too strong to be resisted. People can fight against it, but it's a losing battle. It's, it's essential, it's necessary. I just think, yeah, you cannot, you cannot turn back the clock. You cannot recreate, you cannot bring back traditional religion. There are certain groups like the Amish, for example, or Orthodox Jews who manage to have a strong enough culture to separate themselves from the world. And the Amish are doing very well when the population is dropping most areas of the, of the um, community, they're actually doubling about every, every 80 or 20 years. Really? So it's possible to create that kind of character, but only if you very strictly separate yourself from the wider society because it's very corrupting. What we're working on is a form of medication or a treatment that will help to reinforce that character. So this is obviously not unprecedented within history. I mean, civilizations rise and fall all the time. Yes. Where do you see currently our civilization, predominantly in Australia, where do you see that cycle lying currently? Well, we're in a stage of very rapid degeneration, collapse, no question. And, and within your lifetime, if not mine, you'll certainly see signs of, of real problems. And you can see that already the, the, the sense of community is fraying. The sort of stuff that's going on in America is very alarming. You know, challenge to democratic ideals. You get a, a president who actually tries to defy the results of the election. And that's extraordinary yeah. for, for, a, for a Western European um, society. It's, it's very worrying. And, and we see all this immense growth in technology, and yet our, product, our productivity is not rising. That's because even though we're getting better with things like computers and so forth, people are losing, losing character, yeah. lose, losing ability to work hard, um, losing that sense of innovation, initiative and so forth. Character is declining quite fast. People don't see it. What they can see is the declining the birth rate, which is getting people alarmed. But they don't see the declining character, but it is happening. What is the link between a declining birth rate and the decline in society, essentially? Well, it's, it's all part of the same trend. Wealthy urban societies tend to, the birth rate drops and the character drops. You see the same thing in the Roman Empire, for example, um, or Ptolemaic Egypt or in Han China. You, you see societies which become wealthy, prosperous, peaceful, urbanized, birth rate drops and then they collapse. And what usually follows is a period of anarchy and, and then, you know, the, the barbarians come in and so forth. And, and it would kind of be remiss of us to suggest that that wouldn't happen as modern, modern as we are, correct? Yeah, well, the, people think that technology will protect us, but in fact, technology is what's doing it because there's the unprecedented wealth of our society, which is so destructive. You think that the disparity between the extreme wealthy and it's, it's being perpetuated by technology? Well, we're all wealthy. I mean, people, people on the dole these days suffer from obesity. I mean, that's extraordinary. This is the bottom end of society and they are overweight. That is totally unprecedented in world history. No period of history, not, not the Roman Empire, not anything. And that was, typical, that was something that you touched on in epigenetics and character was you did a study on, on rats where you, you deprived them or you gave them mild starvation. Not, not starvation. It's about, 50, about 25%. Yeah. It's, it's healthy. They actually live longer. We've got rats that are really doing well in old age, so it's a very healthy, but it's, it's just a limit, 25% less than what they'd like to eat. And that was what initially, it was the first thing that alarmed me in the book because 
I know that we have an abundance of food in this in this country or the modern world. You know, and so, like you said, it was unprecedented. Where do you think that that is going to eventually lead? Well, if nothing is done, it'll lead to the collapse of our civilizations. You'll simply for, you'll simply find the economy going backwards. You'll find states breaking down. You'll find empires invading others and taking over countries. You'll find the end of the nation state, um, end of democracy. It'll, it's, 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 it's a classic civilization collapse we're going through. That is really scary. <laughs> yeah. But the point about my research is this, for the first time in history, we actually can understand what's going on and we can reverse it. It's a simple... It's a simple form of medication, which people would take because it would help them with issues like drug addiction, alcoholism, make them better parents, make them able to work harder. So there is, if we could develop a treatment that would reverse this whole trend, people would take it, they'd want it. And if they start doing it, then the whole thing can be reversed and we can go to extraordinary new heights. It seems a little bit contradictory though. So you've got these gatekeepers that have got the majority of the wealth in the world. I just, for me, it felt almost inevitable when you wrote about it, <laughs> it felt very scary at the time. Well, inequality is a problem too. Yeah, I certainly, I certainly believe in that, and, and I think that's that's an issue. Mm. I think society has become more and more unequal, and I'm very concerned about it. But mind you, you know, in the past it was too. If you look at the the Middle Ages, for example, the difference between the, the nobles and the serfs, or even the 19th century, where you have these vast industrialists and and the working poor. In fact, the Solution has never been more equal than it was, say, in the 1950s, the year of, uh, decade of my birth. Really? Yeah, in terms of, of wage distribution and so forth, it was extraordinarily e equal sort of society. Interesting. So going from the almost the fall of a civilization to a, a period where, you know, where you grew up, which was fairly prosperous, um, you, you wrote about a lot of this, uh, your journey with gyms in your book, Every Customer a Fan, which is, in my opinion, just a must read for any business owner. Doesn't you don't have to be a service based business or a tradie. It was it was really good for those that have been living under a rock and don't know the gym's brand and what you do. <laughs> can you just briefly go over the gym's the gym's brand and the structure and the, the current size of the gym's franchise? Okay. Well, I mean, it started basically as a part time gardening lawnmower business when I was doing my university study and my PhD. When I finished and realized I had no prospect of a academic career, which is what I always expected to have, because my ideas were far too radical, then I turned it into a full-time business. And that was in 1982, and then seven years later I franchised. And I honestly didn't expect it to do so well. Somebody asked me at the time, how many franchises might you have one day? And I, I said, if it goes really well, maybe 100. <laughs> That's crazy. Currently we've got about 5,400, um, 40 plus different divisions, yeah. so we're. Pretty strong in Australia and New Zealand. We've got a few in Canada. Yeah. So you've got your, I spoke with this with Joel in another um, podcast, but essentially you've got your, your divisions, which would be your gym's mowing, your gym's dog wash and et cetera, and gym's jumping castles, which is one that I always used to like to call out. So it's great. <laughs> Hasn't quite as much as we'd like, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and more recently, gym's life coaching, I think. I've been seeing a lot of that coming up as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so, and then you've got regional Divisions, is that correct? How well, the, the way our structure works is that you have franchisees who basically do the work, and then you have franchisors who are responsible for recruiting and supporting them, like ringing them regularly and answering calls, running meetings and so forth. For about one in four franchisees, Jim's group actually runs the regional franchises. And then you have a divisional structure. So like the mowing division is ours, and so is dog wash, but cleaning division is other people. So there's a different kind of there's different kind of roles within the organisation. When is it the gyms group would jump in and just take over control of a, a regional division? Why would you do that? Uh, we don't <laughs> we, we don't jump in and take over. We we, we <laughs> buy the rights essentially. Why would you buy the rights? Is, are they not doing a good enough job or something? Um, we can we do about as well as most franchisors in terms of support and growth and so forth. Um, sometimes franchisors aren't quite as good, but also I mean to be pretty blunt, it's a great investment. We buy back the regional franchise rights, and it returns something like twenty five, thirty percent per annum, um, and and then you get capital gains because they grow. 
So it's a very, very good investment. So if you've got surplus money, buying back a region rights just makes good, makes good sense. So it is kind of like an arbitrage opportunity. You're looking at something that's with potential for growth and you come in and you give it a bit more and then you... Yeah. That's, a, that's quite a big jump, about 20 to 30%. <laughs> well, they're, they're good businesses. A gym's regional franchises are very, very good business. But there are some people we would never want to buy out. There's some people who are absolutely fantastic, like the people who run the clean division. Um, Haydar and Ali are just brilliant at what they do. And they've actually had tremendous growth. And I would never want them to go. <laughs> or Bill Cobbenoglu, who, um, who runs um, Jim's Laundry. He's also a major cleaning franchise. Or These guys are incredible. So you... you you, you want people in place who are, because they're actually very innovative. We get different ideas. We, we change ideas. You know, Haydar and Ali will talk about things they're doing and we'll talk about what we're doing. And, and having great people to bounce things off is a, is a big advantage. Something that you mentioned in your book, Every Customer and Fan, was selling lawn mowing rounds. And I, I want to just clarify for the listeners what exactly that means. And also, I'm curious to know, did you have any backlash from the the customers of these mowing rounds as well when you sold them? Um, no, the customers never objected. We, what you usually find is if you looked after customers well and they said, look, I'm unable to continue, but here's Bill who can come in and look after you, customers are happy with that. Essentially, selling the round is, is collating a whole heap of, of mowing rounds yeah. and then you sell them as a group to another mowing? Yes. Look, essentially... Um, Okay, starting a business by yourself is quite difficult. Between 90 and 95% of people who buy, who, who start something like a lawn mowing or a cleaning business will fail in their first year. We know that that's widely available statistics. If, however, you go in and you bought the rights to customers and, there are, and, you, can, and you can make, say, $2,000 per week from the beginning, your chances of success are actually very high, much higher still. Um, that, that's what I used to do. I used to go out and build customer, customer base. I'd, I'd get regular clients together, either myself or some of my subbies, and then we'd sell the rights ongoing. And we used to provide some, a little bit of support ongoing as well. Oh, so did you get a residual off the back of that? No. Okay. That was pre-franchise. Oh. So you were actually pretty flippant about that in the book, and I just wanted to draw an analogy. That would be like a plumbing uh, contractor getting a whole heap of maybe gas annual annual gas checks and then collating them together and selling on selling them to another plumbing contractor correct yeah yeah i can't find another instance of a tradie or a contractor doing that do you have any other examples of a service being on sold like that well it's a very common way to go into business actually in fact when we when we sell it when a, a person has got an established business and they want to leave for some reason they, they just put their business on the market and the goodwill becomes part of the value. So a typical mowing franchise might go for 20000 but it's got a good customer base. It might make thirty or 35000 or, or more. I mean, some of our franchises are turning over in the million dollars plus a year and those businesses can be very valuable. I suppose that's upon exiting a business, but your strategy was you are going to continue to run your mowing business and sell the round itself. I mean, I don't think it's a... Do you think it's a typical thing that the tradies are doing? <laughs> Well, you can't do it in, in divisions, in businesses like, um, you know, like plumbing, uh, electrical, so easily because the work is intermittent. But when you've got regular clients like cleaning, mowing, dog wash, it is a lot easier to do. So look, like people don't realise, but it's quite a common strategy. Uh, it's a good way to get into business. I would yeah. recommend to anybody, if you want to start a business like that, if you can't get into a franchise, which is obviously, from our point of view, the preferred option, and we have a very, very good survival rate, um, so like, something like 88% of our franchisees will still be business at the end of the first year. But if you can't do that, then starting part-time or buying an existing business is a really good way to start because it's very difficult to get going. I have a friend who was um, a very skilled electrician. In fact, he was the manager in the, the domain tunnel. He was all the, in charge of all the people who looked after those lights and so forth. So he's a very capable guy. Started, tried to start his own electrical business and failed. He just couldn't get enough customers to, to, to pay the rent. Yeah, but new leads are a huge issue for, for new businesses. It is. Yeah. yeah. In, in gyms, we have a system whereby, ideally, if possible, we, we find an established business, either a, one, somebody who's exiting or somebody who's splitting a current business which has got too large. But if not, we have a system called pay for work guarantee. So if they, they can go out and offer free services and get paid by us for that. 
And with that, and with fairly heavy advertising, we managed to get them off the ground. But, but getting started is quite difficult in trade business. Is that typically something you would prospect for, or, or do businesses approach you and say, I want to exit, is there something that you can do about it? Oh no, we don't sell other people's businesses, we only sell our own. Oh, I got you, okay, yeah. But if a franchisee wants to exit, or a franchisee does what we call a split, uh, which is okay. very good. Because yeah. a split's very nice, if, you've got, if you're a regular, if you've got a regular mowing customers and you want to build it up and you've got, say, 130 customers, you say, well, okay, well, why don't we split off 65 in this area over here? I can pocket, you know, enough, pay my next three years franchise fees, yeah. which is pretty nice. And, and then I've got a more compact business, which I can then build again. Because most of our franchises stop asking for work after a while. They get, they get too busy in those kinds of businesses. So your franchisees are not obliged to actually accept the leads, is that correct? Oh, no. No. No, no, no they actually put down on the system how much, how much work they want, um, where, what areas they're prepared to work in. They've got territory and then they've got local, all areas. What services they want to take is completely up to them, even what times of day they'll take leads. So it's absolutely not. And well, typically, say, for a mowing job might come in, there might be 30 different franchisees who could theoretically take it, but you might only find one or two who actually want the work. Because, because they do good work, and, and, and a system demands they do very good work. If they don't, they get into serious trouble. They tend to get filled up fairly quickly. And those leads, do you have an average cost per lead? I mean, obviously, it's, it will differ depending on the division, but when you say cost per lead of what? So for the franchisee to accept the actual lead it's, itself, so if it comes into the system and they go, well, yeah, I want to, I want to accept that lead, obviously they're paying they most, for that. They mostly say it in advance. Oh. Because, because they have to actually set, they set it up through a system called Gyms Online, so they actually, in advance, let them know. So when a customer rings up or a customer tries to book online, the system will automatically find the right person to do it. They'll ignore the other 29 who can't do it and just give it to the one person who can. Got you. Okay, that's interesting. Um, well, obviously, the system that you have of dispersing all of this, you know, um, these leads to all of your different franchisors was, was a big win for you. Mm. But in your book, you do lay out a lot of mistakes that you've made, which yeah. I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <that's> <laughs> yeah. I didn't want people to read it and think you have to be some sort of brilliant guru of business who, who always does everything right. Because sometimes people are intimidating. I mean, if you look at the sound people, you think, wow, that's so brilliant, but I could never do that. I mean, I could never be someone like a Bill Gates or a Elon Musk or someone like that. I'm just not at that level. I mean, you, you possibly could be. You're explaining yourself, really. <laughs> well, I'm not quite as successful as they are in financial terms, <laughs> I can assure you. Um, what was it that has been, in your opinion, the biggest failure of yours and, and what did you learn from it? Well, biggest failure of my life is three failed marriages and two pretty blood. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I have a terrible history. <laughs> obviously, I'm an extraordinarily difficult person to live with. Um, so why, why obviously? Why do you say that? Oh, I'm very, very single-minded. I just tend to be unaware of people around me. People get quite upset and they don't even notice it, especially women. So it was very <laughs> difficult. Do you... But I mean, very 21 years, very happily married now. Actually, 23 years, very happily married now. So I look, I've found somebody who's who put up with me. But uh... <laughs> is um, do you think that's a trait that you see in a lot of entrepreneurs? That single-mindedness, that drive for that single purpose. Yeah, I don't know a lot of entrepreneurs, but but the um, apart from my my franchisees, who are most not as extreme as I am, but. Uh, I think you have to be fairly obsessed. Mm. I mean, I do have a, I do, I am, I am obsessive. I mean, there's not a day goes by that I'm not thinking, how can I improve? What can I do better? You know, how can I avoid this mistake? What opportunities are there? Always constantly driven to improve. It's, it's a, it's very obsessional. It's every day of my life, including Christmas Day, every day. I just never stop thinking about it. Does it ever play on your mind that, why can't I turn this thing off? No, no, I enjoy it. You enjoy it? <laughs> You imagine, you imagine a computer game which is endlessly fascinating and complex and creative and always challenging and always learning new things. And imagine you get paid for playing it. I mean, could you think of a more ideal life? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of get the same feeling <laughs> sometimes. 
I love what I do. I yeah. love it, love it, love it. The idea of retiring to me is just horrifying. I just would not, could not imagine, unless I'm senile, in which case I probably will hardly know what I'm doing. <laughs> How do you feel about the idea of retirement? No, I, I cannot come at it. I just feel that there's so much to do. I'm, look, I'm 72 years old. I'm in, in near perfect health, which I make sure I keep, exercise, diet, and so forth. I've probably got another 20 years. Really? I've got a lot to do in the next 20 years, a lot to do. And that's the thing that drives me. There's so much I need to get done. Wow. Well, obviously, you're obviously very dedicated to your craft and what you're doing. There has been reports that you've been reasonably ruthless in your business. And one of those instances was uh, firing your sister. Yes. Uh, <laughs> can you go into detail about why you fired her? And do you actually have any advice for tradies that might be have their family within their business, whether it's their wife or their children? Yes. Well, what actually happened was that my sister, Jill, that I've always been very close to, my, my baby sister, um, she was in the UK. She was without any financial resources whatsoever. She's not exactly a you know, saver and investor type of person. She wanted to come back to Australia and our mother was dying. She was on her last, she was going to go. So, so I wanted, she wanted to come back. I wanted to be, she couldn't afford it. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a job on the basis that I'll, I'll advance you all the money for the, um, the trip, you know, getting out here. It cost about 20 grand, not much. Um, but the idea is if the job doesn't work out, then, you know, I'll, I'll wipe off the debt. So whatever happens, you've got, a, you've got a job to come to, you've got an immediate income, all your expenses are paid to travel here. So that was the idea, which seemed to be like a, a very good idea. And she came out and it was very successful from the point of view that she did actually spend time with mum. Because I, I was very close to my mother, but Jill was able to spend a lot of time with her in the last years, which was great. But unfortunately, even though Jill had what seemed to be a very good CV, she was not very good at work. Her co-workers just didn't, didn't appreciate her. She was, she just, was, just wasn't efficient. She was lazy. She, somebody would give her a job. Her boss would give her a job and she'd delegate it back to the manager who gave it to her. Okay. I tried moving her to different departments and every time I moved her to try and find her a place, which is what we typically do when somebody doesn't work out. So I tried, and she was equally disliked in every other section. The problem I've got is this. Staff are an important part of your business. You can't employ somebody because they're a family member who actually lets everybody else down. It's just insulting to somebody who does a good job. Nepotism can be very, very bad. So in the end, I'll let it go. And, uh, well, she's basically never spoken to me since. Not once. No. We, and you were quite close to her, you said? Yeah, as well. I was for many years. I always used to look after her. I, went, I, I had a, an old car, I'd just give it to Jill because she couldn't afford to buy a car. I was always, I was always doing things, just supporting her. I loved my sister. It wasn't, I still do actually. It, it, it's, it's, it's sad. But I don't know if I regret it really. I mean, I did get her back to Australia. Maybe I should not for a job, but I couldn't imagine how. I know, I know my sister's smart actually. She's highly intelligent, at least as smart as me, probably smarter. But she's just got a different character. A lot of uh, not enough C and maybe uh, promoters yeah. and maybe too much V. Yeah she, <laughs> she, yeah, she doesn't. She, she obviously has a lower C because one of the big differences is this. I adore children. I've got 10 children. And to me, they're just the highest, most greatest thing in my whole life, bar none. Well, along with my wife. <laughs> But Jill, she had one child and she just couldn't stand to be a mother. She just left him with his, um, his father's parents and, and she just couldn't stand it. So she's just totally opposite to me in temperament in that way. So she's, I don't know, she's a modern woman. You know, the important thing is to develop as a human being and, 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 and follow your desires and live the life that you want to in full freedom. Whereas I, to me, life is a matter of duty and responsibility. We're very different. Isn't that interesting? I assume you had the same upbringing. Yeah. Um, I wonder where the differences are, whether it is just the, the genetics or whether something in the environment changed after she left home or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you the answer, and you may want to excise this particular thing from your podcast. Okay. Okay. Something very odd happened to me as an adolescent. 
I did not figure out how to do what every teenage boy figures out how to do. You and didn't. So I did not. My entire hundred percent sex outlet as a teenager was not tonal emissions. Really? And that is very, very, very unusual. And that is the one factor more than anything else that drives this peculiar character of mine. Really? I was just extraordinarily lucky. Really, really fortunate. I didn't figure out how to do that. And it wasn't because I had a feeble sex drive at all. That's quite fascinating, actually. <laughs> yeah. And it explains everything. It, 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 why is my character so different? Why do I love children and my siblings don't? Why am I religious? Why am I Christian? This obsession with, with even the entrepreneurial obsession, I think, comes to a large extent from that. I'm very different. Nobody in my family is like that at all. Wow. Yeah. And this is character, you see. And this is, what, this is what gives me the clue as to how we change things. So if you could actually make an epigenetic change in people, which is quite becoming quite feasible, that duplicated what happened to me, the effects of what happened to me in my teenage years, society would be transformed to an extraordinary degree. What struck me uh, about in epigenetics and character was that effectively you're inserting a protein into the, the promoter, um, or that is what is affecting the promoter. Could we not do that through like some sort of injection or something like that. Can you affect somebody's behavior based on a forcible injection? What we're talking about is epigenetics, okay? You understand what epigenetics is? It's basically the idea. First of all, DNA is like a whole series of taps spitting out a protein. That's what it does. And it could be RNA, it could be anything, okay? So you've got this. Now, what epigenetics does is actually turns the taps on or off. So you can do something like you put a methyl group there and they say, okay, shut that one off or tone it down, or use something like here, histone, or something, and, and you can upregulate it, you can take it out. So environment, such as what happened to me in my teenage years, changes the epigenetics, it changes the way your genes function. It can be short term, it can be very enduring, it can even go to next generation, you know, grandchildren, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. These, these, so epigenetics is an extraordinarily powerful way of describing how these things work. So what you really need to do is to work out a way of tinkering with this mechanism and say, okay, this thing's gone different over here to what we'd like. Let's just adjust it. Now, different ways to do a drugs. Some of these new weight loss drugs like Wegovy and so forth may be having something of that effect. We're looking at this kind of thing. But the best way to do it was to use something like CRISPR, which is a gene editing tool to adjust, precisely adjust the epigenetics. So you say, okay, this is the changes we'd like to have. And it could be because, say, somebody had a really terrible upbringing and they were abused and so forth and they had terrible epigenetic effects. If you understood what was going on, you could go in and you could put a targeted thing going, okay, turn that gene on, that one off, that one off, that one off. And you could completely undo the effects of trauma. And you could also do things like you could help people to be more effective parents. They could affect them, help them to get off drugs, help people to work harder, to be, to be better providers and so forth. Once you understand epigenetics and you have the tools to be able to change that, you could change everything about character. And we're getting very close. CRISPR probably in a year or two will be targeted enough to be able to do it. We actually, we actually know how to make these changes, but the trouble is with CRISPR at the moment, it can have unexpected changes. It's the targeting mechanism. You've got to go right to the correct place and just change that one. But if, you, if you're not precisely targeted, it goes over there and that turns that one, boom. That's the effect you don't want. <laughs> yeah. So you, the targeting is the issue, but it's getting very better. My research here says within a year or two, you'll be able to vi make very precise targeted epigenetic changes. And once you can do that, the world is going to be extraordinarily changed. That is so scary. W what are the ethics behind something like this? How did, where does that fall into it? Okay, I guess you'd put it this way. Let's just say you've got somebody who's got a terrible problem with drug addiction. They're homeless. They're incapable of running their life. They're probably going to die. They're in a very bad situation. And there's a choice. They go to a clinic and the clinic says, we've got this new treatment here that will help you. Are you interested in doing it? They say, yes, you know, my life's really pathetic. So you give them an injection. And as the takes hold, they change their attitude. They say, oh, 
okay, right, well, I don't really need that drug anymore. In fact, what I'd like to do is to get a job. And then they get married and they have kids and they become a great citizen and their life is brilliant and their health improves and their mind improves. They lose all the negativity. How wonderful would that be? I mean, it's, it sounds idealistic, but... But that's the implications of the whole research, that you actually can change people. Mm. See, in a, in a way, religion does this. You have many stories about people who've actually turned their life around because they come to faith. In a sense, religion, religious systems are mechanisms, the cultural mechanisms that achieve these kinds of positive changes. It's kind of crazy, actually. Yeah. I think if people wanted to know a little bit more about CRISPR as well, I think there's a book called Cracking Creation as well, which kind of outlines that as well. Have you read that book? No, I haven't. Ah. I, I've just read a, a book called Epigenetics, which is, but I, honestly speaking, I'm not a neuroscientist. But okay. It's very difficult to comprehend. I understand the basic principles of, of methylation and crisp and, and histones and so forth. I'm sort of vaguely aware, but I, honestly, I leave the details to my, my science people. You got you, got you. I employ some very talented scientists to do this kind of work. It, did you want to touch on what you're doing outside of gyms and where kind of all of your profits get funneled into? Well, basically, um, to attempt to make money from the business, it either goes back into the business or it funds my research program. We're spending several million dollars a year right now on that. I've got a really brilliant research head, former professor. In fact, his last job was running a, a big um, research effort into curing uh, brain cancer and so forth. Oh, yeah. So he's, he's terrific and we're recruiting a very, very talented team of people who are just doing experiments. We just, mostly with rats at the moment. Still rats? Yeah, okay. Going with rats? Well, rats and humans are very similar when it comes to these kinds of mechanisms. Um, it, it's all to do with the limbic system, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus. So rats and people are almost the same. So, yeah, we, we're doing that. We're looking at what happens using mild food restriction and other kinds of changes, what happens to them behaviorally, what happens to them biochemically, what happens to the hormones, and also what happens to the epigenetics. So we're doing a, a study. And once we understand that fully, one of the things we're doing is we're testing a whole lot of drugs, like 100,000 different drugs, to look for the epigenetic changes we're after. And when we find something that looks promising, we can try it on animals. If it works on animals, then eventually humans. And... I mean, that's essentially your, what you, your end goal is, is to, is to fund your research program. That's why you do all of what you do, correct? Yeah. I, look, I never had any desire before this to become wealthy. I really was happy to be an academic living on a very ordinary salary. I, I don't have strong material needs. I live very simply. I mean, these clothes, this is basically Kmart stuff. I mean, <laughs> and, and I, wear, I wear it until they, they wear out. And I don't like things like expensive holidays or flash cars or anything. I don't have that kind of... What I, what I want to do is to, is to fund the things that matter to me mm. and look after my, my kids, of course. You mentioned that you funnel, obviously, the, some of the profits back into the business. And a huge part of what you have done with gyms was actually you, you pioneered a computer system of your own. Are you able to share what that was like back then? Because it wasn't many people doing what you were doing and then also what are you doing now to improve customer success well yes At the beginning we wanted the system to allot jobs to the right people Middly, the beginning it was so manual that it was basically driving me bust i mean you couldn't afford to do it for the fees i was charging but what so then we had to start automating the system and then the more we automated them the more the efficiency grew and then the more the efficiency grew, the more money we had to do further efficiency. But the, look, I'll give you one very simple example uh, of something that's had a dramatic effect on our success. About a decade, 15, 12 years ago, something like that, we, we inaugurated a system of, of surveys. So we survey our customer, we send them an, a text asking them to very simply relate the service. You know, B for bad, G for good, P for too expensive. Um, B for bad is translated as a one-star rating, G is a five-star rating. Okay, and then, and then we monitor complaints too. Okay, we put that in place. As, soon, as we did that, with time, because of the, the information and the feedback mechanism, what that did is dramatic improvement in customer service. Complaints dropped down to a fraction of what they had been. And when that happened, we went from the situation in the early days of June where it was hard to find work to one where we actually had work in enormous oversupply in many areas. 
We knocked back more than 200,000 leads last year, despite the fact that advertising per franchisee is less than what it used to be. In fact, in some divisions, we actually have surplus funds we cannot spend because the advertising money isn't needed. They're all busy. So we actually give it back to them and pay for conferences. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an extraordinary change around from just by improving the levels of customer service using technology, we're able to dramatically increase the number of leads coming in and therefore the income available to our franchisees. So not only do we get plenty of leads, but because we are so busy, they can afford to charge more. We encourage them, charge more than the opposition. Wow. So that's one example that has been phenomenally successful. To actually achieve that kind of success by advertising, you would have to spend millions of dollars a year. An insane amount of money, yeah. Yeah, but, but simply by doing something with IT to make it improve. And look, the, some of the stuff we're working on now is even more extreme. For example, um, one of the biggest problems we have is that franchisees not returning phone calls. Now, the great majority do, but it's the single biggest cause of complaint they don't return the phone call. So we've got a system set up which will be available by January, February next year, whereby if they haven't rung the client back after getting the text, put the lead within half an hour, there's a message. And then there's a, after an hour, there's another message, even more urgent. And these are in my voice, actually. You haven't rung the customer, <laughs> ring them now. And then a lady got to get a message that says, you haven't, still haven't rung the customer, get onto it now. And then a third message says, you really are getting late. You've got to ring the customer. And then at two hours, you've got to bring that customer now. <laughs> this is your voice recording. This is my own voice that's going to come across saying that kind of thing. <laughs> but once we do that, and then if they don't ring the customer and report it back, then there's a message comes back to us and we cut off their leads and we send them, you are off work until you explain what's going on. Wow. So, now, if we do that and a couple of other things similar, our complaint weight will drop to probably less than half of what it is now. Wow. And the service will improve and customers will love it. So that's just an example. And that's, that's hopefully going to happen in the next six months. Wow. Um, I know that you talk a lot about customer service. It was in your book. You say it a lot in podcasts. So I wanted to put uh, it to the test. So I actually engaged Jim's fencing All right. and uh, I didn't just do it. I do actually have a fence that needs to be redone, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk you through the workflow that, that I experienced, right? So I went onto the web, Jim's Fencing website and I submitted that I wanted to do a quote and it brought up a form and I typed in all my details. Very, very simple. And the first thing I was met with was a landing page. So on that landing page was it had already selected my... Um, franchisee yep. and said this person is going to call you within two hours yes and then what I thought was really nice was actually there was a video of you on there and it was saying welcome to gyms thank you very much for turning you know for using gyms but I didn't receive my call in two hours oh dear I actually got it in one hour oh okay that's <laughs> ideally you should have got it within two minutes two minutes oh my god well, we've done we've done we've done tests on this. We've found that, for example, if you if you call a client after two hours, your chance of getting the job is less than half. In one particular study, if you if you call them within the first two hours, but after the first ten minutes, your chance is seventy eight percent. And then if you call them in the first ten minutes, as reported by the client, increases to eighty five percent. So actually, the speed of call is enormously important. Wow in terms of whether you're going to land the job or not. It's not just the price. In fact, price comes into it, but it's less important than service. It is kind of striking to me that it was a nice experience, but it seems to me that that, is, that should just be the, the bottom, like entry level for a lot of service-based businesses and tradies. Yeah, isn't it amazing that it's not though? I know. It really is. Like I haven't someone, my sister, sorry, my daughter, Sarah, uh, who's newly married, just expecting a baby, um, they moved into a new house in Thornbury and they've been trying to get services done. So they thought, well, Jim's is too expensive, so let's get other people onto it. I mean, it's so unreliable. They don't, they don't call back. They don't turn up. So she started to use my people and the experience is just tremendous. She's just a convert from experience. <laughs> like everything that she wants done, she's getting, she got the conveyancing done, which was beautiful. She got a building inspection done, which was really, really smooth. It's great people to do with. She's got handyman services done. She just wants something done. Gyms is great because they call back. They look after you. They follow up. 
It's not, it's not 100%. We do make, we do fail sometimes, but that's the aim. But look, you can do it statistically. Pre-franchise days, roughly speaking, we used to give a book. But for every 100 leads I took, gave out, we used to get about 100 complaints. Wow. So it was quite a lot. It was very bad service. This is when I was building up and selling lawn mowing rounds. But subcontractors, not very reliable, went into the franchise system. A few years later, we started measuring it. And there's a lot more systems of training and support and so forth. Down, it was down to 5% for every 100 leads, five complaints. That's it. already extraordinary. And over the years, it's dropped and dropped and dropped. Now for every 100 leads, there's like a fraction of 1%. So you've got about 99% 90, plus improvement in that measure of customer service, which is the complaints. So it's, it's dramatically gone down and we're still trying to get it down further. That's, that's the great key to it. And the point of it is, it's not that we actually put customers first. In reality, we put franchisees first, but the way you get franchisees great income is for them to give great service and for everybody else to give great service. So they get lots of leads and they can charge good money for it. When you say good service, is there something that a tradie listening might be able to implement pretty easily that has the most ROI when it comes to customer service? Just the basic stuff. Return phone calls, turn up when you say you will. Let them know if you're not going to do it. If you can't get through to a client on the phone, then you text them. I mean, just simple things. When you send a quote, don't just send a quote. Email, text support of it. Follow people up. Just the really simple, most basic things. Look, it's very difficult. We've actually got a system called Biz where we actually sell some of our unserviced leads to external people. It's very difficult to give, get them to get the same level of service as Jim's people do. Even though we cut them off the, the needle like that, if they don't do it, we really are very tough on them. Even so, we, we cannot get our independents to get the same service no matter what. We, 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 we coach them, we send them messages, we remind them, we cut them off if they don't do it. But even with all of that, it's, it's, you can't get independents on the average to get the same level of service as our people do. Typical Jim's franchisee at a possible five would score something like 4.7 or 4.8. Independence, maybe 4.4, 4.3, which still means that, that you know, 85 to 90% of their customers are getting good experience. But, but the, 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 there's, there's 10% who don't, and that's the problem. That's still quite high for an independent. Do you vet them coming in? We don't vet them coming in, but we vet them from experience. Oh, okay. In other words, if they don't, if they let clients down, then they get warned and they get cut off if they don't. So we have a, a winnowing process. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because obviously, you it, can't yeah. tell. People sound good on the phone. Nobody, nobody says I'm going to give lousy customer service, but most people aren't very good, actually. <laughs> That's the one thing about the trade industry, too, is it's really quite extraordinary. The level of competition is not very good. If you are reasonably good, just do the absolute basic things return phone calls. Turn up when you say you will. Let the customer know if you can't. Just a simple, wear a uniform, properly assigned vehicle, the real simple things. It's remarkably easy to succeed. To have good customer service, you've got to have customers. <laughs> so in a previous podcast, I spoke with Joel, your CMO, and we talked about success you'd had with social media. Um, you were effectively doubling your business in a, in a three-year period, a uh, five-year period. What do you say to tradies that don't have much of an online presence and are thinking about using social media for their business? Oh, definitely should. But one of the great benefits now is Google My Business. So you get to Google, make sure you get to Google My Business listing, which isn't difficult. You just have to go through the process. Very easy. And then you start getting reviews on it. Mm. And then when somebody looks up, you know, plumbing, Doncaster, you come up because you're in that area and they see all these five-star reviews great reviews and stuff. It doesn't, actually doesn't hurt if there's a few bad ones in there. It's more credible. Yeah, exactly. But if the great majority are positive and saying good things, if you work on that. But social media is very powerful. Look, it's hard for people who don't understand it very well. I must say, I'm not, I have to admit, personally, I'm like that. I don't even use social media. Joel does all that for me. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, um, it's a very powerful weapon. Do you ever think about, I spoke with Joel about the metrics around what he's doing for gyms. And he said, Jim's very good. He doesn't particularly um, measure much for what we're doing, but as overall, he understands that it's a, a broad brand awareness. Do you think that a lot of businesses should take that approach? Oh, I think they should too. Yeah. Well, it's a matter how sophisticated somebody is though. I mean, it's not easy most people to do it. We, we, 
We train our franchisees to do it, we encourage them, we show them how, we give them support and advice. Even then, it's difficult to get most franchisees. And generally speaking, a gym's franchisee is going to be above average as a tradie. They, they often come from very good backgrounds, like corporate and stuff. You'd be surprised who actually, we had doctors, we had lawyers, all kinds of people coming in, taking franchisees, franchises. What? Yeah. So they're generally, the kind of person who's going to invest $30,000 in a business is usually reasonably cluey. But even amongst those, it's, it's hard to help them to do it. Do you think it might be just getting on camera? It's just seeing, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I, can't, I couldn't even record myself on camera. How did you how did you find the introduction? You were kind of almost thrust into the limelight because people say there are questions online like is Jim real and stuff like this, like effectively going from nothing to a hundred. How did that affect you? Well, becoming known is pretty weird, I must say. I'm sort of recognized in the street these days. I mean, always in a positive manner, I must say. People don't throw rocks at me or anything, but <laughs> I should hope not. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind it. I mean, you always try and be pleasant. I, I keep a box of books in the car, so if anybody saw it, I can say, hey, have a book. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you know, I might buy a franchise down the track. <laughs> so it, do you don't think it's adversely affected your personal life? No, not really. Um, I, I get a lot of calls and comments for franchises, but it's part of my job, and I, I enjoy it, actually. I mean, the greatest thrill of all is to be able to help somebody. Hmm. You can see somebody's got a major problem, and you can just, okay, let's do it. Let's know what the contract says and just do it this way. Or this is extra things you might not know about. Or here's cross-divisional work you might take. Or here's a list of franchisees in your area from other divisions that you can offer free services to. Or just I, 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 There's lots of things I can do to help people. And I, I find great pleasure in that. I mean, look, look, the hardest thing about it is the franchisees sometimes fail and you never get used to it. Yeah. I, I had a, a few weeks back, I had an had a, had a interesting week. I had a... Um, I had a million dollar unexpected tax bill and, and one of my franchisees was failing. And, and I can tell you, financially speaking, the tax bill had a bigger impact. But emotionally speaking, the franchisee failing was far more hard to take. A mil over a million dollars in tax? It was just unexpected. I didn't know I had to pay it. So it's <laughs> all right. I'm pretty well off. It didn't, it, 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 it's not as though it, it didn't... didn't yeah. <laughs> You didn't crack the business or anything like that. It was just not one of those, you know, somebody says you've got an extra million dollars to pay. It's not like good news. Hey, happy birthday. I mean, <laughs> but I guess what I'm saying is emotionally speaking, it just doesn't affect me that much. It's just business. Yeah. But exactly. somebody failing is really hard to take and, and always driven to say, okay, what went wrong? Did we, did we not screen carefully enough? I mean, the one thing happened quite recently is I discovered that um, one of my franchisees had a um, been trialed on the road, this dog wash person, and then failed fairly quickly. In fact, quickly enough that we gave them all their money back. Now, the interesting thing was when we checked up on it, we found that the person who trialed them initially had actually recommended they not get a franchise. They said this person is not suitable. But the people responsible for putting that person on did not listen. Why not? Because they wanted the sale. Oh, because gotcha. they, were, they were incentivized, incentivized to do it. Exactly. So what I then did, and this is not untypical, I went to the document and I said, okay, before you sign anybody, I want you to give a, get an actual written reference from the person who did the trialing to send to you to say this person is suitable. If they don't have that, they don't get a franchise. Now, it's not something that happens very often. Mostly people do actually screen properly. But to the fact that they didn't, this poor woman, I mean, luckily she realized in time, but that should never have got that far. Yeah. Because that's just an example of sort of things that happen. And because franchisees approach me all the time about problems, I, I get to hear about stuff that's going wrong. And then I look at what's gone wrong. How can we change the system? Yeah. I mean, you, from your book, you've got quite a strict screening process when it comes to new franchises, correct? Yes, we do, but not everybody follows them, and that's the problem with anything. It's like customer service. Mostly we do very well, sometimes we don't. What do you do about the situation when they get through? See, I have three principles, which has been from the beginning. Our first priority is the welfare of our franchisees. We're also passionate about customer service. We sign the new franchisees and franchisors we're convinced will succeed. In other words, when in doubt, say no. So those are the three fundamental principles behind Jim's group. Wow, that's, that is strict. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, if you look, it's on my email. It's on the front of my book. It's all there. Well, you mentioned you had people from university. 
or, or doctors or you know academics that have come in and actually joined your franchise. Um, when speaking with Joel, we touched on university and how it was probably one of the best marketing campaigns of all time, really. <laughs> Where do you see the current state of university in Australia? And what advice would you give to somebody who is considering getting a degree? Look, degrees are very helpful in a competitive environment. If you want to go to work for some like a big company, they often don't even look at you if you don't have a degree, and these days increasingly a master's. However, having said that, I think it's a big mistake for a lot of people to go to university when they don't really have that kind of mind. And I wish more people would consider the trades. I would think being something like a skilled tradesman, carpenter, whatever, plumber, electrician, is a, is a fantastic potential career choice for somebody who's not particularly academic, rather than going and spending several years running up student debt on something they're not they're necessarily good at. I mean, all the studies showed that people who work out, like construction workers, gardeners, and so forth, tend to be happier than those who work inside, like lawyers. It, it's, it's well known that's the case. You can also make very good money. I mean, our typical franchisee, and they're basically lawnmowers and cleaners and so forth, would turn over just a bit under $150,000 a year. This is based on latest surveys, which means you're clearing 100,000 plus a year doing a job with flexible hours, working close to home, able to spend time with kids growing up, all the advantages. To me, a trades business is a very good option for many people. And I think it's sad that people have this prejudice against manual work. Where do you think that prejudice comes from? Because I remember at school, the option didn't even feel like it was there. No. Where is it? How have the universities been able to indoctrinate this whole it's a, it's system? A, it's a disease of wealthy societies, again, that people turn their back on manual work. They really do. They look down at it. They say somehow somebody who sits down with an office with a computer is somehow better than somebody who works outside with their hands. I just think that's completely rubbish. I think competent tradesmen can do extraordinarily well, have a brilliant life. And I know so many cases where people who come from that kind of educated background, white kind of background, and they've come and they've bought a business and, and their life has turned around. They see their kids because they work better hours. It's flexible, it's tax-wise, it's effective. You know, a partner can help. Having a at-home partner, actually, like a mother, is very effective because you can split your income, she can help with the books and so forth. So it's, there are so many advantages. I think this, this prejudice in favour of these um, white-collar jobs is, is over the top. Oh, I tend to agree. <laughs> yeah, people go law degrees, okay? That's a classic thing. You know, the great majority of law, law students don't actually practice as lawyers. It's just, what are you spending three years doing a law degree for when you're not even going to be a lawyer? There are more law students in Australia than there are lawyers, at least one of my sons says, who happens to be a lawyer. And poor Joel is a lawyer as well. <laughs> well, he is, yeah, because his mother, his mother wanted him to get the degree. But in reality, he's done brilliantly here. Yeah, he's really found his calling here. I mean, he's been here for young, hasn't he? He's got a lot better job than most lawyers do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there is a lot of pressures on young people in Australia at the moment. You've got ridiculous cost of living, house prices are insane, and you're seeing a lot of unrest, I mean, across the world. So recently you've had the, the Bangladesh uh, Prime Minister who's actually fled to India yeah. fled to India because of student protests. And then we just had a YouTuber by the name of Phidias who has actually been elected to as an independent into the European Parliament. So based on your experience with societies and history, are we headed for a complete collapse of society? Well, we are, yes. A decay, not, not a sudden collapse, but a decay, yes, definitely. Unless we can turn that around, yes. That's where, that's where we're going. It's, it's so obvious. When I came up with biohistory, people, it's, it's alarmist, it's, it's exaggerated, it's not true, whatever. I think the collapsing birth rate has probably got people freaked out for the first time more. They've seen, you can't ignore the fact that people are stopping having children. Yeah. You know, you've got, like, in, in South Korea, there's... It, Fertility rate, replacement fertility is 2.1 per women. They were down to about 0.7. They're about a third of the level. They bring out a third as many children as they need to to maintain a population. Japan, East Asia, most of Europe, even America and, and Australia, we're seeing our, our birth rates going down below replacement and, and, and doesn't seem to be slowing. Crazy, isn't so it? So there is, there, is there is a sense of alarm. I mean, in, for those listening, it might seem a little bit daunting and 
Actually, in my last podcast, I spoke with um, Tamara and Dan from Trademark, and we spoke about mental health, obviously. But one of the conversations that that really shone through was was purpose, mm. um, and and particularly for tradies, having a manual trade really they attributed a lot of happiness to having a trade and purpose. What do you think uh, is the best way to be happy? Okay, I'm very interested in the science of happiness. I read a lot about it and I've also experienced things, but there's certain kinds of things in your life that are related to happiness. Being a churchgoer or any part of any religious congregation, very strong related. Being married, definitely. Working outside, exercise, which could involve a manual job or could just involve being exercised, avoiding um, excess alcohol and drugs and those kinds of areas, and, and, and overeating as well, um, and having a sense of purpose in your life, which is often created by religion. That, that, these are things that really, really make a difference. The, the people think that the way to be happy is to have more money so you can buy a flashier car or a bigger house and more expensive holidays. But these things have very literal relationship to happiness. Income has surprisingly little impact on happiness once you get past about the Australian average Australian income. And the kind of things that you that you pay for which which indicate status, like cars and clothing and houses and so forth, have no relationship to happiness at all. In fact, the, the best thing you can do with money to create happiness is to give it away to a cause that you're involved with, which is of course what I do. Does it, does it, do you attribute a lot of your happiness to giving the, yeah. your money away? Yeah. Yeah. But, but like, I, I follow the principle. I'm an active churchgoer. I'm very happily married. I, my life is driven by purpose. My research team is probably very, very important. I also keep fit, exercise a lot, spend a lot of time outside. I just follow that classic thing, control my, control my diet. It's, it's, there's a science to happiness. I mean, if you're not happy, what's it all for? What is, what is this? You're building up a gigantic exactly. you know, franchise like you've got. What is it all for if you're not happy, yeah? Well, no, and I wouldn't say the purpose of life is to be happy. The purpose of life is to achieve something, to do something worthwhile through, through your, your work, through your community, through your church, through your children, particularly through your children. That is the purpose of life. I don't believe that life is to be lived, to be happy. That's the problem. Because actually when you chase happiness, that's the one thing you're not going to find. You've got to say there's certain things more important than my happiness, like my community, like service to God, like, like having a meaningful life. And ironically, when you turn your back on happiness, so that's not the top priority, is when you become happy. It is really Well, ironic. alcoholics, actually, who ask them, that's one of the most characteristic things alcoholics will say is the purpose of life is to be happy. And therefore, they take what they seem to make them happy. Because at the moment, I feel like a drink, so I'll have a drink. Or I'm a heroin user, I'll have an injection. Because that makes me happy. But in fact, doing the things that are short-term good for you are the, are the very things that are really bad for you in the long term. And it's to do with the way our minds are structured, actually. It's to do with things like the dopamine effect. If you take something like a drug or alcohol or fast food or any of those things, what you get is an immediate surge in dopamine, which makes you feel better temporarily. But what it does is it actually changes the brain. It actually basically dampens down dopamine receptors so that overall you feel worse. And then you need more of this stuff just to feel normal. Whereas if you do the opposite thing, if you restrict and you discipline your life and you work on things that are worthwhile, it has the opposite effect. It actually creates this sense of well-being and happiness. But you can't chase happiness for its own sake. Do you think, you mentioned about dopamine, do you think that potentially social media is going to play a huge part in the next generation but it's becoming a lot more unhappy. It's very malign. Social media is extremely malign. It stops people from relating to others because community is one of the biggest things behind happiness. Social media, being with other people, family, friends, church, whatever. Social media takes you right into this artificial world with all these likes and stuff. It doesn't have the same levels of satisfaction. It's associated very strongly with the rise of anxiety and depression. It's, it's evil. And also this whole chasing of likes and stuff. Searching for status is a really miserable way to live your life. Mm -hmm. I put out a post myself having a fun at a party and stuff like that. And I get all these likes, 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 likes. That's like a drug. And it's, it's, it's evil. Because for a start, what you're posting is not real. It's just a carefully manicured, and people looking at you and saying, oh, I like this, but you know that person's obviously having a great life. They don't realize the bad parts. 
So you put this unrealistic idea out and, and, and everybody thinks that they're less successful than somebody else. So you get this misery. Theodore Roosevelt said a great thing. He said, social comparison is a thief of joy. And that's like a century before social media became a thing. So we already knew all about this. <laughs> well, I don't, we knew in a sense, but I think we don't know. Yeah. I think the search for individual happiness is a really, and status is a really, it's a disease. It's, it's, it's toxic individualism. It's what, what matters is what's good for me. What do I want? How can I grow as a person? How can I achieve my goals? How can I, how can I achieve the, the full freedom of what I want to do? But that's not a that's that's not a recipe for a good life, or even the, in the long run, even a happy life. People are increasingly lonely because they're cut off. We need purpose in our lives. The purpose is family, it's community, church, children, the things that really matter. That's what we should be focusing on. That is that is true happiness. But don't chase happiness. You don't make a decision based on what I want to do right now. What is the right thing for me to do? What should I be doing? I don't always feel like doing the right thing. You know, I don't always feel like going for a run, but I know I need to go for a run. I might not feel I need to do something to do with my research, for example. I might feel a bit lazy. I'd much rather veg out and play computer games, which I honestly do too much. <laughs> but you've always got to do the things that the best things to do, the right things to do, not what you immediately want to do. And by doing that, and that's where faith helps. If you're in a strong community, like Latter-day Saints are really good in that sort of sense, or Orthodox Jews, people like that, Amish, people like that, very driven by community, by rules, by purpose. They tend to be a lot happier than the general population. Well, Jim, I think I might leave it on that note. Um, this has been a really insightful conversation, and I, I hope the listeners have got some value out of it. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. All right. You're welcome. Jim, a massive thank you for opening up about all your business endeavors and personal life as well. It was super insightful. All right, you know the drill. Uh, make sure you share this with your mum. My name is David List. I am the Digital Tradie. And until next time, keep creating some legendary content.